Okay. Well, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you again and um, see people that we know. We've been going to a different church, a bit bigger, and um, everybody wears masks, and so it's hard to actually get to know people. Um, they all look the same. Um, so it's good to be able to put names to faces. It's such a big thing. All right, well, you must be getting familiar with um, 1 John by now. You've already covered two and a half chapters and some tremendous verses. And today we're only focusing on seven verses, starting in chapter 3, verse 18. So if you've got your Bible and you'd like to turn to that, 1 John 3, and going back to, I think, a verse you might have done last week, verse 18. As we read through, uh, you might like to just try and pick out the main topic word in each verse as we go. So starting at verse 18, here we go. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Now, I'd just like to read a little um, devotion from Daily Bread. And uh, this was just not so long ago, if you read Daily Bread. Um, it says, no such thing as ordinary. When Anita passed away in her sleep on her 90th birthday, the quietness of her departure reflected the quietness of her life. A widow, she had been devoted to her children and her grandchildren and to being a friend to younger women in the church. Anita wasn't particularly remarkable in talent or achievement, but her deep faith in God inspired those who knew her. When I don't know what to do about a problem, a friend of mine said, I don't think about the words of a famous preacher or author, I think about what Anita would say. Many of us are like Anita, ordinary people living ordinary lives. Our names will never be in the news, hopefully. And we won't have monuments built in our honour. But a life lived with faith in Jesus is never ordinary. When you obey God, your faith won't be in vain. God can use you in ways that go beyond your lack of notoriety. If you feel discouraged about seeming ordinary, about the seeming ordinary state of your life, remember that a life lived by faith in God has an impact throughout eternity. Even if we're ordinary, we can have an extraordinary faith. So, Anita, had a real, genuine faith. And these verses that we're reading this morning are about being the real deal. So let's just pray as we uh, focus on what we're going to be thinking about. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you help us this morning to understand what these verses are about. We pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you'll give us eyes to see the needs around us in our fellowship and in the wider church here and overseas. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you give us willing hearts to respond to those needs as you lead us. We pray that you will enable us to live our lives with confidence and to make a difference as we put our faith and trust in you. We pray that you'll just guide us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, did you pick up uh, some of the key words as we read through that? We had um, love, truth, belong, 
confidence, ask, commandments, believe, and spirit. And I have to confess when, uh, <clears throat> when I was sort of allotted this section of verses and I looked at it, I sort of thought, oh yeah, that's about truth. Um, that'll be all right. And then when I started to read it and uh, study it, I found that it was actually quite different. And uh, it's quite an interesting little section of verses when you get into it. So how do these words all fit together and what's the main message? And as we uh, consider this, there are three questions that we really need to ask ourselves. And here they are. So... The exam for this little section is an easy one. There are only three questions, and they're all yes and no answers. Uh, but maybe it's not going to be good enough, so it's either yes or no. And the first question is, uh, thinking about our own faith walk with Jesus, we can ask ourselves, is my faith walk authentic? Is it based on truth, the teaching and example of Jesus? And then the second question is, is my faith walk proved? Is it evidenced by acts of compassion and thoughtfulness towards others? And the third question, uh, is there consistency in my faith walk? Am I abiding in Christ and assured by the Holy Spirit? So there you go, there's the three questions. Uh, think about those as we go. Remember uh, that John's style in this writing is that he, he kind of goes in and out, he goes back and forth, and he goes around the topics. So that um, as you're reading, you sort of think, I've read that before. But what he's doing is he's emphasizing points to really make them stand out. Uh, he wants us to understand the big things that he's trying to impress on us. And I think he probably anticipated that some of the readers would make changes as they listened, and I'm sure that one of his goals was that people would be encouraged. So verse 18 uh, says that if we don't have pity on other Christians in need and respond in some sort of positive and meaningful way when we see that people have needs, then we don't really have God's love in us as our primary motivation. In verse 19, John goes on to say that having the evidence of love, actions or deeds in our lives as a witness or is a witness or proof of the integrity of our relationship with God. So we need to have the proof that, that things are happening and we're responding uh, and then everyone will be blessed. We spent some time with my uh, sister last evening and she was dealing with a situation where a friend of hers had basically been chucked out of their home. She had four children, uh, not married to the, the man that she was living with, uh, and a bit of a tough customer, probably um, challenging authority sometimes, but with three weeks notice, had to leave. And um, because it's not the first time that this has happened to her, she kind of reacted probably in a way that maybe wasn't as wise as could be. And they decided to uh, buy a camper trailer and um, they're going to live basically on the side of the road, not too far from Brisbane. And uh, her aim was she was gonna try and homeschool her children. And Mirren was trying to deal with that whole situation. And um, there are these needs around us. And when we find out about these needs, they are a challenge to us to try and do something to help. And when we're doing that, and we're doing it because of the love of the Lord in our lives, then that's a witness that our walk with Jesus is authentic. James says, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. And he says, I will show you my faith by my deeds. So we're being exhorted here to love with acts of kindness and particularly looking at our fellow Christians and the people that come across our paths that God directs in our directions. I guess uh, that James ought to know 
um, as the brother of Jesus, he observed that the Lord always backed up his words with actions. And God is love, and if his love is active in our hearts, then we will be motivated to help others, those in need, in some way. Now, in our home group, we've been studying the book of First Peter. And I realised the other night that there is another side to the love coin. What the apostles are teaching is a little bit like a two-sided coin. And uh, that's a Canadian $2 coin uh, with a really cool picture of a polar bear standing on a piece of ice. Um, and what the apostles are teaching is a little bit like a two-sided coin. On the yes side, we've got dear children, our love should not be just words and talk, it must be true love, which shows itself in action. This then is how we will know that we belong to the truth and how we will be confident in God's presence. But there's another side, the no side. And this is what it says. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. And when I read that, the word that stood out was all. Rid yourselves of all malice, all to say, all slander. So the no side is important too. Sometimes we just have to keep this closed. Both sides of the coin work together and you can't have one without the other. It doesn't work. Your witness for Christ will fail. We're doing things and we're not doing things. Verse 19, it talks about the truth. And the truth in verse 19 is really implying the pattern of life that Jesus demonstrated and taught. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when we see how Jesus worked and talked and walked and how he lived, we see the one life that pleased God 100%. And nobody will ever match it. But one of the main things we learn in the New Testament is that God wants us to be transformed to be more like Jesus. And it's an ongoing process. But it's worth remembering that there are two sides to the love coin if we want to please the Lord. In verse 19 again, the NIV translation says we set our hearts at rest when we back up our faith with what we do. The ESV version says it uses the word reassure our hearts. And reassure is a good word. From the meaning of the Greek words um, written in the original manuscripts, we could say that John is getting at the way we think about ourselves or how we talk to ourselves. And we could use the word conscience as a part of us. The trouble is the way that we think about ourselves can sometimes be wrong. Our conscience is not always reliable. But there's a problem with conscience. It says we face a problem. The conscience is fluid, it's not fixed. Almost all people adjust their conscience between childhood and adulthood. And the adjustment is almost always downward. That is, we learn how to turn the volume of our conscience down so that our ethics align with how we want to live and not how God tells us we should live. The only antidote is knowing the mind of Christ. We need to be people whose consciences have been captured by the word of God Thank God for his word. It exposes the lies we tell ourselves to make us feel better. And I thought, that is so true. We can't necessarily rely on our conscience. You know, our conscience is activated by two sources. The devil is one. He loves to make false accusations to put us off like, I'm not good enough, 
or I should have done that better. And one of his favourites, that was a waste of time, it didn't make any difference, why bother? That's how it goes. And sometimes when we think our thoughts, when we focus on ourselves, they're too severe. We're just too hard on ourselves. And um, too much negative introspection makes us take our, law, our eyes off the Lord Jesus and away from faith. Then, of course, the other influence on conscience will be the Holy Spirit. He can use our consciences to spur us on with faith to do what's right. Okay. We should remember that the Christian life is like walking a pathway. We're not at the destination until the journey is over. And you can be sure there's going to be some difficult sections. And the picture on the right, of course, is taken from Pilgrim's Progress. And um, he's going up a hill difficult. And we were looking after the grandchildren last night at Merrin and Tim's place. And after the, the grandkids had, had gone to bed, I was looking through the, the bookshelf and um, Tim had a copy of Pilgrim's Progress there and I just I had a look at a new copy and um, I just started in the middle and by chance I happened at a chapter called Vanity Fair. And if you've read the book, as Pilgrim goes, the road has to go through this town called Vanity Fair. And um, as I read, I thought, wow, this is a good description of city life in 2021. The sort of stuff that was going on in Vanity Fair whenever they, he wrote the book centuries ago, same thing today in our cities. Um, we have to be careful as we move along the path that we don't get stuck in Vanity Fair. And our aim is to get better at what we do. And we need to resist the devil. And that's why it's so good when other Christians take the time to give us encouragement. It helps us to keep moving. It helps us avoid getting bogged down in negative self-talk. So encouragement is important. If you have a look at verse 20, If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Remember, the only person who can make a 100% accurate assessment of the value of our actions is our Heavenly Father. He knows. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We have his listening attention. But to know what his will is, we have to be studying his word, what he's written to us in the scriptures. And when we make the time to do that, with the hope that in everything he will be glorified, we will make spiritual progress because we'll have his goals in mind <clears throat> and he's the master designer and the master planner and he deserves all the glory and God in these verses promise us, promises us confidence as we move on The thing is, unfortunately, we can't expect sinless perfection in this life. So what's important then is that, we sh that there should be no unconfessed sin, no issues outstanding before God, as far as it rests on us to do something about it. No unconfessed sin. So that means not holding on to wrong things, not covering up wrong things, and not treasuring wrong things in our heart. Well, okay, there are two benefits to an assured conscience. Firstly, it means that we'll feel free to go into God's presence in prayer, like going to a loving, caring Father. 
who will help us. It's the first benefit. And secondly, when we have this confidence which Peter is talking about, which is based on our actions and our response to people in need, we'll find that we have greater freedom to speak and boldness to risk doing stuff for God. And here's another thing. When we take the time to encourage another Christian for their actions, we'll help build their confidence and their potential to do even greater things. And psychologists have shown, and from our everyday experience, we know about human nature and the way our minds work, um, but often there's a fluctuation in the way we feel and the way we think. We feel more confident and less confident. And sometimes it's not obvious why we feel like that. But God's word encourages us. I love going back to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. If we face a problem, uh, these verses are a big encouragement. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's about grace and mercy. And God gives the invitation. He invites us to come right to the throne of grace with confidence. And we can go there. Any Christian can go there and he will lift us up. And this too, we can boost our confidence by writing out and memorising key scripture. Promises that we can go back to in troubled times. For instance, looking at the ones I've got written down there, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Another good one from Romans, Romans 8. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Psalm 26 verse 3. I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. So we can always go back and know that God has unfailing love towards us and we can rely on his faithfulness despite how we feel. Verse 22 says, And receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. This is an incredibly strong and positive promise. Receive from him anything. And what do we make of that? Anything. Now, Any mature and seasoned Christian from experience will tell you that not everything we pray for is going to happen. We have to accept that God knows what's best. What John is saying in these verses is that if we want to be heard and get the right response from the Lord, what we need to be doing is paying attention to what pleases him. And what pleases him is spelled out in the commandments. God's commandments. And they're all significant. Fortunately, John draws our attention to just two of them in particular, um, which he emphasises. So just turn back a page to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, start again on that one, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. 
Now, what that verse is getting at is consistency. It's a consistent walk with God that makes the difference. Consistency gives confidence. And the trend is that we have to keep on keeping on in our walk with God. Okay, I'd just like to, um, to read this little prayer. Listen to what this says here. When we're in line with God's truth, we have to be reading the scriptures and acting in love. Our hearts will not condemn us. We'll be praying for greater things. We'll be bold coming before God. And there will be a willingness to take risks when God gives opportunities. That's how it works. Let me just read that again. When we're in line with God's truth, we'll be reading the scriptures and acting in love. Our hearts will not condemn us. We'll be praying for greater things. We'll be bold coming before God and there will be a willingness to take risks when God gives opportunities. Verse 23. It says, And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. So the first thing John says is believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Well, how can a belief be a command? Don't we have a choice? Now, that's the response of some people when they hear that. So if someone says, I believe in Jesus Christ, what exactly do they mean by that? All sorts of people believe in Jesus in some way. He was a great teacher, maybe. He lived and got crucified on a cross. So what? No, John is calling for a belief based on an initial strong mental commitment and a spoken confession of faith based on belief in our inner being and followed up by a lifestyle demonstrating love and action. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 tells us about faith. It says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, a strong commitment to begin with. Actually, when John says, believe in the name of the Son of God, he's actually doing something else in verse 23 here. He's paving the way for what he's going to go on to talk about in chapter 4. And in chapter 4, he starts to address the issue of some troublemakers in the church who were denying the incarnation. They were claiming that Jesus wasn't really God in the flesh. So, believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. And another thing, it's not at all a mindless command to believe in the name of Jesus. The thing is that God has given us minds and we're expected to use them. We can evaluate the evidence. And here are just five lines of evidence that back up that belief. First, the amazing and undeniable design which is evident in nature, points to a designer. And the Bible tells us who it is. And despite all the efforts of people like Hume and Dawkins and Attenborough to muddy the water about that, it's still true. Design in nature points to a designer. And the second uh, line of evidence is the life of Jesus. He did everything well. And he did nothing wrong. His life stands out. It's different to every other person that we'll ever meet. And the third line of evidence is that he performed miracles in front of crowds of people that proved that everything he said was true. And fourthly, the crucial events around the crucifixion and the resurrection fulfilled amazing prophecies that were given centuries before We've got copies of the manuscripts that prove that they were centuries before. And you couldn't make it up how Jesus' life lined up with all those prophecies. We can have a solid faith 
in God's word. And the last one is the evidence of the testimonies of the martyrs. Good people who follow Jesus, obey Jesus, and who are willing to die because they know Jesus, they won't back down. And at the same time, they passively accept their fate because they trust Jesus. That's the evidence and the testimony of many thousands of Christians down through the centuries and many thousands of Christians every year in our present time. They won't back down because they believe and they know that Jesus is real. And then the second command John reminds us about is that we really do need to love one another. Easy to say, often hard to do. Love with real empathy and compassion. And I'd just like to read you another story from Daily Bread. When a friend cared for her housebound mother-in-law, she asked her what she longed for the most. And her mother-in-law said, for my feet to be washed. Now, the thing about old people is their feet start to cause a lot of problems. When I was working as a security guard for the aged care village where Jewel works, the people who were going in and out the most were the podiatrists. Every day, there was a podiatrist coming in to see someone's feet. Um, and when I went over to New Zealand to see my dad, 94 years old, his feet were awful, terrible. Um, so old people have issues with their feet. My friend admitted how I hated that job. Each time she asked me to do it, I was resentful and would ask God to hide my feelings from her. But one day, her grumbling attitude changed in a flash. As she got out the bowl and towel and knelt by her mother-in-law's feet, she said, I looked up and for a moment I felt like I was washing the feet of Jesus himself. She was Jesus in disguise. After that, she felt honoured to wash her mother-in-law's feet. So the second command is that we love one another where we can, how we can, as best we can. So why did Jesus go to the cross? Did he feel like it? I don't think so. If you read John chapter 18 and the description of his anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he surrendered to the mob, he was utterly appalled and nearly overwhelmed by the thought of what was going to happen, that all of our sin would be dumped on him and that he would bear the consequence of every single one and be forsaken by God. Have a look at verse 24. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. In John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 7, it says, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, it says the words of Jesus must stay with us, and then in that same chapter, John chapter 15, verse 5, it says, Whoever abides in me and I in him, these two verses together show us that Jesus himself abides in us when his words, we have his words abiding in us. It's a choice. We need to spend the time in his word so that we know him well. And the reason Christ's words in us result in answered prayer is that they change us into the kind of people who love what he loves. And then we ask things according to, her will, according to his will, and that's how it works. Piper says that when Jesus fills our lives and our thoughts, we will find his commandments, all the commandments, much more reasonable and we'll want to work them out in our life. When saturated by the word, more truly will your prayers be heard. And the second half of verse 24, um, 
says, and this is how we know he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. There are two no's in that verse, and they're both different. They're different in the Greek. The first, no, this is how we know, is gnosko, which means we have learnt something like you learn mathematics. So we have confidence in it and we can rest. Sorry, it's um, the learning is the thing. And then the second no is oida, which is a second, a, a settled conviction, and the past experience is the thing. It's settled so we have confidence and we can rest. When I was in primary school, we lived in a house in the southern part of the North Island in New Zealand. And in wintertime, we relied on a big open fireplace in the lounge room. And we had piles of coal and firewood on each side of the fireplace. And wintertime down there, it can get really cold. So on a night, everybody in the family eventually ended up in the lounge room um, to keep warm. And that was the best place to be. Not just because the fire was there, but because the family belonged there. And there was a warm sense of um, familiarity and fellowship together in that room because we belonged. And that's what John is getting at here when he talks about the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 is an important verse. It says, The Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. So the Holy Spirit in us is the way forward. He does many things for us. The one thing to say, though, is that God's Spirit gives us that sense of identity, that we belong. And we have confidence in our identity as God's own adopted sons and daughters, the family of God. And to close, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, assures us that when we make the step of commitment, believing in the name of Jesus, we are marked and sealed with the Holy Spirit from God. And that gives us confidence too. So, summing up this little section, which actually follows on from what you had last week, I imagine, um, we need to look around. We need to link up with some Christian organisations, organisations which are making a difference in the world, and we need to keep up with international news about aid organisations and missions and suffering Christians overseas and find out what's happening. COVID and other issues have badly impacted many communities. And people, Christians, are crying out for help and prayer. And we can all help in some way. So what can we do? What can you do? We need to go for it. And as we do, God will reward us. Okay. Thank you, Ellen.